So as I was saying, mazes are pretty darn awesome. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the Wikipedia page for mazes. Now, unlike other professors, I love Wikipedia uh, because it's actually pretty great about like stuff about like stuff like mazes and things that people get really nerdy about. A hedge maze mage at a home in England. People love mazes. Um, so here is a small maze. Um, we also now part of the reason I like mazes is because you know I play a lot of of this game, Dungeons and Dragons, right? Got like tons of books here. You know, this is, and these were just references for last night and those involve like dungeons, which, can, which are fairly simple mazes, but like in classical uh, dungeon crawlers, you're typically going through a maze. In fact, in some older dungeon crawlers, you weren't even provided with the map. You'd have to draw the map yourself, which, let me tell you, could be a royal pain in the tuchus. Um, but um, there's but we're going to be dealing with standard types of mazes as opposed to circular types of mazes where we are on a grid. Uh, now, the fun thing about mazes is that when we look at them, we can always uh, move them into graph the you can always move them into graph theory, but that's perfectly fine. Now, the reason why we like mazes as computer scientists um, is because, um, yeah, the reason why we like mazes at the moment uh, is because there are maze solving algorithms and maze generating algorithms, which actually end up being the same thing because you got to use mazes to do that. Maze solving algorithms are actually fairly simple for most mazes um, because most mazes, like this generated algorithm, we assume that you're starting at a, when you're writing something, uh, you're going to be doing something like starting at one entrance to the maze and one exit to the maze and where the entrance and exit are defined by a wall, right? You see how they're on the, these entrances and exits are on the wall. So the most simple algorithm for getting through a maze is what we call the right hand rule. Um, or the left hand rule, it doesn't really matter. It has nothing to do with the weird right, uh, the, the weird thing to figure out stuff for engineering. Uh, and, but right hand rule means just simply take your hand, place it on a wall, on, uh, take your right hand, place it on the wall, okay? And then proceed to not let go of the wall. And so, if we follow this right hand rule, we'll see bu -bu -bu -bum, bu -bu 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 -bu. we've just simply keep our right hand on the wall at all times. If everybody's following my cursor. And now we just loop around here, come back here and we're out. Right hand rule works if you're in for a lot of ma for a ton of mazes where basically what you're trying to get to is like a con is connected to a wall. Um, however, if you're dealing with something like a labyrinth, where maybe you're trying to get to the center of the maze, it's not necessarily going to work. Um, classical, we, we, we see mazes in classical mythology. In fact, we get the word labyrinth from the whole uh, legend of the Minotaur. Minotaur, Min I don't know. How do you pronounce it? Labyrinth. Right, our classical labyrinth, just kind of weird and windy, uh, but specifically the legend of Theseus versus the Minotaur in the labyrinth. Um, awful legend involving really weird stuff and generally the general problem about Zeus and his infidelity. That's basically most of Greek mythology, Zeus, uh, Zeus just, you know, has trouble keeping it in his pants and, and causes a lot of trouble. Um, and then it's up to basically human descendants of Zeus to fix that problem. Really kind of tells you a lot about the way the Greeks saw the world. But anyway, I digress. So you basically, we can see Theseus who slew the Minotaur that he's got something in his hand, which is thread. Now it happened to be magic thread, but the point being is that it's thread. And the idea here is that you got this labyrinth, right? and we can see that this thread 
is trailing behind him. Very good job on the artist by the artist over here. Um, the artist being Edward Byrne Jones, a pre-Raphaelite painter who lived from 1833 to 1898. So if you're listening from beyond the grave, uh, Edward Byrne Jones, good job. Good job on you. Um, anyway, so we know that basically that the way he gets through the maze and not get wound up in this crazy spinny labyrinth over here, right? This is like got loops and stuff that are pretty crazy is that he's got this thread that he's dragging with him at all times, able to keep track and that helps him keep track of where he is. Specifically what he's able to do is that if he crosses paths with a thread, he's gonna just treat it like a wall because he's already been there. No need to, to go back to that point, right? Um, and then if you get to a dead end, you just simply wind the thread back up. Now, typically you probably need, now fortunately, now typically though, how'd you prevent yourself from like revisiting any location? Well, you note that he's got um, this big knife thingy. I think we call it a sword, uh, but anyway, it's pretty useful for, uh, it's not as useful as other things, but you could definitely use it to make marks on the walls and stuff. So really what you need is two things. You have need a way of, of basically knowing where you were, some kind of thread, and some kind of way of basically saying, I've been there. Um, if you've got chalk, you can do that. If you've got two different types of chalk, you can do that. You can use one color of chalk to say, this is the path I'm following. And then when you backtrack, because you're at a dead end, you're at a dead end now. So you can just basically, then as you unwind, your thread, so to speak, you can mark the path that you're backing up. So you know if you see two marks, then you don't want to repeat going down that passageway, essentially. Um, now the process that we're going to be learning today is, uh, or in the, for our maze is called death first search. Uh, that means basically that, um, now we go into greater detail about this when we go over breath first search, and um, but it's one of the ways of generating and solving a maze. It's the way basically that means we generate, we look at a pass, we go down a passage and then proceed to solve it. Um, so first let's talk about maze generation algorithms. Um, you have one function over here, which is to solve the maze. I go ahead and generate for you. Uh, I do a very poor job of generating my maze. Um, so let me go ahead and run it. It's again, a graphical thing. Unlike a bunch of other stuff that, that's graphical, I totally made this one from scratch myself. So I'm happy about this one. Uh, and you're basically starting at the green dot and you wanna to get to the red, the red location. It's a five by five maze. Let me go ahead and boom and, and uh, make this a bit more interesting. Let's do a 30 by 30 maze. All right, you just simply change what size you want the maze grid panel to be. Okay. Um, this is made up of uh, three classes, by the way. The first is our frame, which is, so GUIs in Java basically have three, have basically two components. They have the frame, which is like the window, like, and but when I say the window, I mean like the part with the X and the, and the, and the maximize and the minimize buttons, right? And then you've got a panel of some kind. And you can put panels in panels, but basically it's a window. You put a panel in the window and that's what you see. So now the, my maze generation algorithm is very simplistic. It's a Northwest maze. Basically, except for the, for the first row and first column, I followed a very simple thing. Uh, flip a coin. If it's heads, I, re if it's heads, I remove the North, I remove the North South wall. If it's, uh, if it's uh, tails, I remove the east-west wall, and so this gives us a winding path with a straight with a straight diagonal path to the, or sorry, with a curvy diagonal path to the exit. Um, it's e it was easy for me to write and always generate something that's always going to have an answer. Um, by the way, good maze algorithm would have an answer, um, but if you're solving a maze, sorry, if you're generating a maze using a maze generation algorithm. Just got realized I have a paper cut on one of my fingers and it's really stinging, it stinks. All right, so um, maze generation algorithm. 
So this is an animation of an algorithm that's being used that uses def for search to create it. So what it's doing over here is that basically it's just randomly winding back and forth and the completed routes are basically in blue. And what he's doing is when he gets a dead end, that blue represents him traveling back to find his location. So he's generating his maze like this. He's winding back and forth. And these depth first search algorithms always create these kind of windy paths. So, but notice that basically it just starts and basically he's with, this is for generating a maze. He's just kind of digging out this area for him. Um, there's other kind of maze generation algorithms like this, Kruskal's algorithm, which generates these segments. And then we see that they're gonna kind of merge these segments together. And it creates this kind of different style of maze. Every maze generation algorithm has a bias of some kind. Um, Here's some recursive maze generation where basically it says, let's split each cell in half. And then for each cell, we split that in half randomly. And so as you can see, what it does is that it makes a very grid heavy kind of maze. You can kind of see like the four by four, the two by two pattern and, and see how it splits. It really looks like it's a cell of four by fours. Um, but what we're looking at is, I'm, so if you want, you can do, there's extra credit uh, for generating the maze. That's not the code that I need. So, um, so you can, the you can write there. The extra credit is basically implement the maze generation algorithm. But what I want you to implement is the maze solving algorithm, which is very classical for like robots and stuff. For um, some intro classes, uh, if you've got ro if you happen to have robots, uh, now. I've already went over the right-hand rule and you can see how that works in this context, right? How he just felt followed the right hand and got out of the maze. And that would probably work for my, for my algorithm, but honestly, we want you to use death first search um, for this one. Uh, which I honestly did not go, which hmm, looks like they took it out over here, but whatever. It's pretty easy over here. So if we look up in my algorithm for this, hold on. Oh, <laughs> my wife's possibly on the temple live stream at the Ambler campus because she is, um, she's going and seeing the corpse flower. Um, Ambler campus has a corpse flower that's bloomed and uh, it like blooms for a day and it smells. Anyway, so anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at our algorithm. It is fairly straightforward. Now, def for search typically uses recursion, which is what we're going to be going over soon, but honestly, it's way much easier to do it like this. Um, def for search is this is the whole idea with the mate with the chalk and the thread and stuff. Rather than using um, so what we're using for our thread to go back uh, to to backtrack is that we're going to use a stack. Now, for if you haven't watched the stack videos yet, stacks are super basic linked lists, essentially. Stacks are like the simple version of a linked list. And what do I mean by that? I mean that how the way they work is that all you can do is add to the head and remove from the head. That, so if you haven't watched the videos yet, a stack is a linked list where all you get to do is add to the head and remove from the head. That's it. That's the only operations you can do. Oh, well, sorry. You can also see if it's empty. So you can also see what, what, what's em if it's empty and you can also see what's at the top of the head. And so what I've done is I defined the start of the maze to be zero, zero, and the end of the maze to be the bottom right corner, okay? So, so the maze is broken up, in, is this array over here, it's broken up into cells. Make sense? Each kind of square of our maze is what we call a cell. 
right? And we can see that the start cell and the end cell are highlighted, okay? This is, make sense to everybody? Okay, so, um, so, the, so the stack is our, acts as our thread because we can push something to it and then we can pop, which is the way we get something off of the stack. Push something onto the stack to put it on the top of the stack and then popping it will get you the last known location. Like it will take off the last thing there. So you can use, so you can keep popping to keep backtracking. So what is the other thing we can do? What about like marking where we've been? Start dot set background, sorry. You can any set all the cells, which is their own function. Cells have a, are, have these uh, qualities on them. They have, um, they have, a north, they have walls defined as a true fa false value, right? Makes sense. And then paint component doesn't really matter. Um, and then what was it? Ah, set background. Because they are J frames, sorry, J panels, they have this method over here called set background. And what that does is pretty obvious. It makes it that, that cell, that color. So for instance, if I say, uh, for instance, if I were to say maze uh, two two dot color dot set background color dot now there's a bunch of predefined colors you can make your own if you want to uh, by creating a new color and giving it the RGB values. But honestly, I'm just going to go ahead and make it cyan because that will burn your eyes. Okay, and notice that cell 22 is now a cyan color. Cool, huh? So we can use that to mark uh, where we've been. And conveniently, I've actually made a function for you down here called visited, which given a row and a column, it's gonna get the cell from that column. So it's gonna get that cell at that row column combination and get the background. And if it's white or red, then you haven't been there yet. So if it's colored anything but white or red, then that, so you can use any color uh, aside from white or red to mark whether you've been there or not. Make sense? Um, so, and white's the default color, right? So for the maze, because you know, paper is white. And then we've got, uh, and then the red, then the red is just simply to know whether you got to the end, so you can check. Hey, am I at am I at the ending, or is the or is it red? So okay, so how do we does the algorithm work? Well, fortunately, this assignment is one of the one of the ones that we're going to keep seeing throughout the uh, uh, throughout the semester, which is um, problems in the mirror may be easier than they appear, um, so to speak. Um, I'm a big fan of giving you problems that look really complicated, but actually turn out to be fairly easy when if you if you read, because the point of this problem is that I have the algorithm right here for you. And what you need to do is translate that into Java. So here's the algorithm. We put the start position on the top of the stack. I cannot. I am teaching class, Laser. All right. So we've got, well, you ha would have to come and get it yourself. But we've got ourselves. Um, so, so let's see. Where are us? All right. We put. Oh, I see her. Okay. I see the. So here we put our start and fit uh, onto the stack right over here. So that's the first line in our algorithm over here cover, okay? So we do that. So what you have to do is the rest of this. While maze exploration is not done, and I totally misspelled maze exploration and said, keep forgetting to fix that. And the stack is an empty. How do you know if the maze exploration is done? I don't know. For the beginning, for the be Okay. But hold on, I need to do my class. So while maze exploration is not done, 
So while you're testing, rather than, I would try to figure out, I would try to get this condition done less, last. Instead, like do a for loop that runs 10 times. So yeah, your guy's only gonna do 10 steps in the maze, but you know, that would, you can solve that. Um, peak to get our current position. So that's, so again, the stack has three operations. Push to put the, your, to put something on the head of the stack, pop to remove the head, and peak to, which is essentially get index zero. Stacks don't have indices, but essentially that's what it is. It's, it all, it's all add index zero, remove index zero, or get index zero. So peak to get like what cell you're at. If we can go north and haven't visited there yet, so how do you know if you can go north or not? Uh, whether or not there's a wall. So conveniently, conveniently, by the way, uh, to prevent out of bounds errors, the entire border of the maze is surrounded by walls. So you can't go out of bounds by, so as long as you check to, if you can go somewhere first, then uh, that will work. So while, so if you can go north and haven't visited there yet, push the location uh, uh, to the north on the stack and mark the current location as visited. That's how you move, by the way. Um, how do you move as you're exploring the maze? Whatever the top of the stack is, is your current position. So you push your next position onto the stack. So push where you wanna move and then mark where you currently are as visited. In other words, color it. Else if, if we can go, so if we can go north and haven't visited there yet, do this. Otherwise, if we can go south, do the same thing, except for south and then repeat for east and west. Make sense? So you basically ask yourself, can I go? And then finally, if you can't go anywhere because none of the directions are, so yep. If all the directions are places you can't go, then you're at a dead end. Use a different color to mark it as a dead end and pop it off the stack. So long as you're using a well, one color for your current path and one color for backtracking, you'll actually automatically draw uh, your solution, which is pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, a partially working solution is 50 points, a fully working solution is 100. The extra prob credit problem, Honestly, it's much tougher than five points, so it should be like 50, it's going to be worth fifteen points. But this is a fun one because you get to go through maze, mazes. Um, once you're done with this, the next the next module is recursion, which is also fun because we are doing in recursion we're going to be dealing with really awesome things like um, like solving a chess problem. Uh, either the eight queens or knight store problem, whichever you prefer. Um, which if you don't know how to play chess, that's perfectly fine. They, the problems define how they work. Uh, they're, very, they're very common programming problems. And then the other one is making an automatic Sudoku, uh, uh, Sudoku uh, solver, which is a puzzle game that's pretty easy to understand. And I'll go into more detail on those on Thursday.